On this edition of What's in a Game, we're going over the Nuggets schedule. Grace will try to convince me to be more excited about the schedule, and we'll go over all the interesting little details. We will talk about whether the Nuggets are really a contender, and then we're going to rewrite the NBA Rivalry Week. Welcome to What's in a Game. I'm Will Jones. I'm here with Grace Jean. Matt Moore was scheduled to be on the show, but unfortunately he did fall ill, so we hope him a quick recovery. We'll try and get him back on the show at some point because we love Matt here as well as all of our viewers do. But how are you doing, Grace? I'm doing great. I feel bad for Matt because uh, he's been... I know he also missed uh, Locked on Nuggets, you know, because he's a co-host of that show as well, so... Uh, you know, I don't think that he, uh, you know, he takes his, he takes his job over there really seriously. So, you know, he's really, um, going through it if he's got to miss a recording. So like you said, we're just wishing him a full and speedy recovery. Yeah. He's a busy personality and a journalist who writes a lot. He's on a lot of shows. He's everywhere, so when he goes down, I'm sure he's going to miss a lot. But if there's any time to kind of take a break, it might be now, despite the fact that he is one of the more interesting people to talk about the schedule, which is why we wanted to have him on, because some people may underestimate the importance of the schedule. It is hard it to... Will. <laughs> yeah. It is hard to maybe like fully grasp all the details of the schedule and how it might affect a team, especially before the season starts So yeah, I was excited to have him on just to kind of educate me and the viewers on some of the more important aspects of the schedule, which I'm sure he will still do. Like he'll come back on Locked On and talk about it. And if we can get him back on this show, we'll talk about it again. Yeah. So really big news, Will. We actually hit 500 subs a few days ago. Um, I think it was right before right before you went on your trip. So I kind of wanted to celebrate that a little bit because, you know, we did our in-person episode after we hit 300 subscribers. That's a really big milestone. I had no idea that this show was going to grow that fast. And it seems like we, you know, saw an uptick in um, activity on the YouTube page in particular during the Olympics. And so that was really cool because I really wasn't sure. I I was really interested in international basketball and FIBA basketball and following the Olympics, but uh, it's really cool to see that, you know, our, our viewers and some new viewers have also found that to be the case. So I don't know, I'm just excited about that. And I wanted to, you know, just reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, thank you everyone who subscribed and who takes the time to listen to us. It means everything. You guys are supporting us and keeping the show going, so that's incredible. Please subscribe if you haven't. We would love that. We, as fans of the Nuggets, were able to cover the Olympics because we had some Nuggets players playing, and we love their international teams because we have international players, especially Jokic on Serbia. We got a lot of fans from Serbia watching, which shout out to all you fans in Serbia who tuned into our last episode about uh, the Olympics and their amazing run. I did have uh, just one thing to say about that too. We actually got uh, our last video was actually our was that our most popular video like ever by by a mile for sure. Yeah. And a lot of that is because of the Serbian fans of of the Nuggets of Jokic of Team Serbia that you know showed out to uh, watch that video. And we got a lot of comments. And you know when you get a lot of comments, you're gonna get a lot of good and a lot of bad. There was one that I came across that uh, just wanted to give a little bit more uh, credit to Serbia's defense, which I didn't really talk about on our um, Olympic wrap-up episode, but that is something that really, to me, made the biggest difference. Obviously, the three-point shooting came back for that team, But the biggest difference between how they looked in group play versus the knockout round, they really turned it up. We could see early on they were trying to apply a lot of ball pressure and all of that, but the rotations on the back line weren't always there. The transition defense was definitely a problem against really athletic teams like Team USA and South Sudan, uh, particularly in the group stage. But once the knockout 
phase started, and in particular the second half of that game versus Australia, right? Uh, Serbia really buttoned down on defense, and a lot of the credit for that goes to Alexa Vramovic and Marko Guderic, Dobric as well uh, on the perimeter. Petrovic and Jokic obviously, you know, trying to hold down that front line as well. So to the user who commented on our lack of comment on Serbia's defense, thank you for that because that was something that I did want to shout out. Yeah, we had talked about their defense on and off throughout all of our Olympic coverage. I think we talked about it more in the um, exhibition games more yeah, than the knockout yeah. ones or the group stage. Well, which, the group play, they were looking like Yeah, I rough, mean, they were kind so. of, kind of yeah, <laughs> ramping up. And uh, I think maybe we take some of that for granted just because we know how Jokic plays on defense, his style of defense, which is maybe underrated. And with the defense of three seconds, we had mentioned before, maybe allows him to be a little bit better of a rim protector than he can be in the NBA because he can just plant himself down there and use his great hands to react and get some blocks which was amazing to see when that happened. And Absolutely. obviously Abramovich won a like defensive award or whatever, like the, Oh yes. Yeah, so, I believe um, that Alexei Abramovich actually won best defensive player. So I guess like defensive player of the tournament, the equivalent went to Alexei Abramovich, which is really impressive. And I thought he was great. I thought he was great whenever he had to guard anybody that wasn't named Steph Curry. Right. <laughs> he was incredibly impactful, um, incredibly impactful player uh, for team Serbia who, you could see like that team was really in need of his point of attack defense. Like whenever he was off the floor, I'm like, get Alexa back. So yeah, really important anchor to that team's defense and thinking about <laughs> the kind of player that he is and the energy and what he does at the point of attack kind of reminds me of KCP and maybe <laughs> it makes me a little bit nervous about yeah. uh, losing yeah. him for the Nuggets. There was a commentary throughout the Olympics from Nuggets fans who were ready to sign Abramovich to the Nuggets, like get him over here. We need some defense. We need I mean, some we guard just need, like, play. Another player. <laughs> yeah, we yeah we want more players too. Uh, we have to lose some on the roster first. Wink, wink. Calvin Booth. Anyway, but now I mean, people were even like speculating about uh, bogey trades. Like, how do we get him on the team? Obviously, he's way too expensive for us. We'd have to trade probably a starter, which we're not willing to really do right now. But I would love to see him play with Jokic on the Nuggets. That'd be crazy and then there were some rumors that popped up that maybe the nuggets are interested in Michich. i don't know how legit that is but i saw rumors swirling on twitter about that we'll see the last thing i want to say about serbia to wrap this up is we had comments about the officiating which i guess we just didn't really dive into that because it's such a hot button topic it's kind of subjective it can be hard to evaluate fully Maybe there were some bad calls here and there, but I just think for the most part, we avoid refing commentary unless something's like very egregious or like really affected like the last couple seconds of a game or something where like a team got a possession they maybe shouldn't have and that affected the outcome. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that I'm probably going to get some number of uh, serene viewers of this in my mentions or not <laughs> because it's not an Olympic episode, but we can talk about refing when you don't blow. A 17 point lead you can't talk about refereeing when you blow a 17 point lead uh in this game so uh yeah i shouldn't have been in a position to you know make that a potentially deciding factor you know we we talked a little bit about just refereeing on the whole you know comparing it to the nba and refs not necessarily going for as much stuff there were a lot of times where I actually felt like they need to blow the whistle a little bit more here because there's some like clear violations happening. It's not not just not like Team Serbia in particular. This was just like throughout the tournament, just a little bit. So it's one of those like grass is always greener on the other side <laughs> type yeah. things. I do think that if you could say anything about how they how it impacted the games, particularly during France's run, the fact that the referees allowed defensive players to play more physically in general, I think favored good defensive teams. The United States was a good defensive team throughout this tournament run. That's one of the reasons that they were so, um, you know, dominant. It wasn't just like they were coasting by on their talent, although you could you know talk about the defensive talent on that team as well. Um, but also Team France was able to overperform, and it was in not just large part, I think it was entirely because of their defense and, you know, having a, a tighter 
tighter whistle, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, would serve to augment that, um, that advantage that they have because they don't have a lot of offensive talent on that team. But if they can, you know, completely stifle you like they did with Canada and Germany, then they will always be in the game that always, ha always have a chance. We even saw when they played Team USA, while the USA always had that game within control, they were never really able to pull away. And I think Team France's defense was a big part of that. One of the few games where Team USA did still score a lot, but it wasn't, um, you know, a, a, an explosive offense like you saw in um, in their other games. So similar to how they played versus Serbia. Yeah, and that does remind me, the last thing I'll say is it was fun watching Serbia's ball pressure in general as a team and how they tried to apply it and when they backed off of it when they tried to put in the defensive effort, when they maybe weren't putting in that effort. Because I feel like sometimes there was like a switch, even with Abramovich, where he was like, wait, I can be a little more physical here in this matchup. And maybe, you know, not that he was fouling or should have been called a foul, but when you, maybe he's more experienced at towing the line between being super physical and not being called a foul. Whereas maybe the US players aren't as used to that playing in the NBA. Um, they, they don't necessarily know like, what they can get away with yet because they're like masters that kind of grifting and you know the veteran moves that draw fouls on offense and defense in the nba and maybe they're a little less clear here i don't know that it played a huge role but uh actually you know what serbia got screwed by the refs they would have won they would have got a gold if it wasn't for the refs i got well, you serbia playing for the serbian audience i got you hard. serbia they got screwed okay <laughs> Yeah, so next week we are going to be having Asher Levy on the show to talk about the Nuggets offseason and rank it in the context of the Western Conference and the NBA as a whole. So we're really looking forward to that episode as well. Look out for that next week. But I am ready to jump into this week's content, which is schedule nerd stuff <laughs> okay so let's just let's talk about the big dates the denver nuggets have their season opener which is the first big day of the nba regular season schedule anyway on october 24th versus oklahoma city that is a really important game because it is versus a division rival obviously it's the first game of the season it's at home you want to set the tone it's a game where Christian Brown probably moving into the starting lineup is going to face his first real test as our main uh, guard and wing defender at the point of attack versus Shea Gillis Alexander, who finished <laughs> second in MVP voting last year. Will, what do you think about this game, about this matchup coming on the first night of the season? Opening games are interesting because you kind of lack context of the regular season leading up to it. You're fresh. Right. Everyone's excited. You have excited no to idea play. how how other teams are playing, how you're playing, yeah. how everyone's going to feel. Mm -hmm. All we know is that the Nuggets are one of the better teams and the Thunder are one of the better teams in the West for sure. So I like the matchup. I don't know how much I'm going to take away from this other than general impressions of how the Nuggets roster looks and maybe some rotation pieces i think people are going to be looking a lot towards the young players and how much playing time they're getting and what the rotations are this might be different because malone might see this as a more competitive game because it's the thunder and maybe those young guys may not get the similar rotations they would get in the rest of the regular season in this game because he's kind of he did that even last season um but it, who knows maybe he learned his lesson from last season and he's like regardless of the matchup or the moment or, you know, the stakes. I actually need to play these guys regardless, and I need to be more strict with the minutes and less beholden to the idea of, like, taking out a top contender in this game. I don't know necessarily how Malone views those big matchups, like, with contenders, as mm -hmm. far as, like, we need to win this game because yeah. it's, a bit, it's an important team, so... Yeah, I think that they're going to take this game seriously. Like, when you're talking about, you know, pacing guys and trying to... You know, make sure that, yeah, like I said, guys aren't playing too much or, you know, whatever it is. I don't think that that's a worry so much in the first half of the schedule. Like, we're going to talk about this with the structure of the Nuggets schedule, but this year in particular, it's going to be pretty important for them to hit the ground running. And they usually do. Like, they're a team that that usually starts off the year really um, well, kind of start to build a cushion and then 
you know, slog through the sloggier parts of the season. Uh, but as for the matchup itself, I think Balone absolutely cares that it's OKC, that they're not just a division rival, but the favorites to come out of the Western Conference, if you ask basically any national analyst right now, because they were the number one seed last year. They played Dallas pretty tough, uh, even though they lost that series. And they have an MVP candidate in Shea, and they got better, right? They got Isaiah Harnstein from the Knicks. I do think that that's going to be an impactful addition to the team, even if I'm not quite as high on their overall regular season as some others. And Alex Caruso in for Josh Giddy. It's interesting because, you know, the Nuggets lost KCP, and Christian Brown's going to be stepping into that starting role if everything goes as we expect it to, right? Everyone's still projecting this idea of like, Malone's like, I, you know, nobody's, n- nobody has earned their, earned that starting spot yet. And Christian's like, I haven't earned that start, that starting spot yet. Christian Brown's going to be the starting shooting guard, unless something crazy happens at training camp, right? I actually think that the loss of Josh Giddy is going to make a bigger um, impact on OKC, not just, not overall, but I think they're going to take a little bit longer to adjust to that change than the Nuggets will losing KCP because he wasn't in like a playmaker role. Josh Giddy was like relatively important for at least anchoring some of save and non Shea minutes. And even in SGA's minutes, he was this like important secondary ball handler. They don't really have that anymore unless you're counting Caruso as that. And even if you are, he's not the level of say playmaker that Josh Giddy is right. Even though he brings shooting, he brings defense. Like it's just going to be a different team. Whereas OKC is usually predicated on a good amount of ball movement. And I think Josh Giddey was important to that, even if I don't think that he was like a good fit for that team long term. That's just something they're going to have to adjust to. Um, The Nuggets have their own adjustments to make, particularly in, um, say, non-starter minutes, non-Yogic minutes, however you want to look at them. And we're going to see what those look like starting on, well, really in preseason, but uh, for real, for real, (laughs) on this first regular season game versus OKC. No, I mean, it's interesting points all around on the Thunder. We were missing a secondary kind of creator ball handler last season. So that is a good point about Giddy. Yeah. Um, because I think he is a good passer. And connective. I don't, yeah, I don't know, like, where I'd rank his playmaking specifically. I don't, like, watch him enough to really know. Yeah. But I think um, he was the best, easily the best passer on that team. Yeah, okay. So it'll yeah. be just interesting to see if that does affect it. But I, I want to see the Jokic I heart matchup. I want to see, I mean, we've seen it a little bit, uh, you know, against the Knicks last year, but it'll be interesting on this team. Um, and then what else? I'm what interested else? to see how OKC uses Hardenstein, honestly. Like, yeah, are they going to start him? We've seen OKC in the past. Sometimes they adjust to their opponent, especially when they're facing, say, a size deficit like they would against a team like the Nuggets. But other times they lean all the way into their identity, which is small ball, shot at the five. um, And then they would just play like Caruso in that spot. I'm curious to see what they do on night one. Uh, Not just because it's, you know, what they would do against Denver, but they're also setting the tone for their season. So I'm curious to know, because I I think that's their season opener as well, even though it's, it's, it's not at home. I'm curious to know what direction OKC is going to try to use as their baseline. So that'll be another yeah. interesting question to watch with that game as well. Yeah, I mean, these West playoff teams maybe have more in their bag to bring out during a game. This is the op- opener. So, you know, I don't know how specific they're going to get with scheme versus just trying to like play the way they want to play and see how it goes. Right. Um, we'll see. It'll be Those kind of things are always interesting. Last season, we kind of, I felt like we came out of the gate really well like the first two weeks we i think everyone was excited to play basketball again coming off the championship and i was really impressed with how we came out and then quickly the gas that we had was burned up uh and then we had real highs and lows of the season so the other big date on the schedule is like an individual game is of course christmas day versus the phoenix suns and you know a couple of people have pointed out i think dating back to two seasons ago whoever plays and beats the suns on christmas day has won the western conference in the playoffs 
oh, that true. year. Yeah, it was at least starting from the the year the, the the last Warriors title, and then the year after that, of course, the Nuggets beat the Suns on Christmas Day. We had the famous. Uh, AG poster dunk over Landry Shamit in that overtime thriller. And last year, it was the Dallas Mavericks absolutely drubbing the Phoenix Suns. And then, of course, the Mavs won the Western Conference in the in the playoffs. So I think that that game is important because I've already started seeing Suns fans online talking about how they want to break the curse or reverse the curse. <laughs> Because <laughs> they don't want to be the good luck Chuck team anymore. They obviously are a team that has title aspirations. So they think if they win their Christmas Day game versus Denver, that they can, you know, get some vibes up, get the uh, basketball karma back on their side and yeah. <laughs> win the Western Conference. What do you think about that? Yeah, we also have a game against them on the 23rd at home. So we That's were going right. from a home game against them straight to a road game against them. So I don't know how about that'll affect the Christmas game specifically. Whether, let's say we win that one, are we going to be less motivated to try to win again on the road? Because like we just beat them, then the Suns will be more motivated. Or will it be a flip of that scenario? Will it not matter because the Nuggets want to play really hard on Christmas regardless because the christmas games always seem pretty exciting for and some national reason. tv game as well yeah. yeah last year we had the nuggets play the warriors it was at home on christmas and they had a more you know prime time for christmas days like middle of the day but versus the suns this year it's going to be a late game uh, which is otherwise prime time you know, on any other day it would be prime time maybe i would have been less excited <laughs> about that christmas matchup before the Kevin Durant stuff, but now there's going to be some uh, <laughs> there's going to be some fireworks True. between the fans and that Kevin Durant shit is going to kick back up around then, I guarantee. Oh, so man, that's <laughs> fun, especially because it's going to be a home game and then a road game, um, not back yeah. to back, but you know in in sequence like that. So yeah. we're going to get fans lots gonna of Kevin Durant. Katie. We're going to talk about Kevin Durant a lot because, but no, because he's an important player on that team on any given night. He's either the first or second best player on the Phoenix Suns. He was the most, I think, most important player that changed teams during, uh, you know, during that trade deadline uh, two seasons ago, of course, right? Because he instantly turned the Phoenix Suns into a contender in everybody's eyes and you can understand why it's Kevin freaking Durant, right? But they have, you know, underperformed uh, since, or at least in the view of, of some, I think that they've performed exactly what they should for a team that traded away all their depth for um, three redundant superstars. And I don't even blame Kevin Durant for that. And, you know, we yeah. can get into it when we talk about everybody's off seasons, but it's more about the Beal deal for me. But yeah, it's Kevin Durant. The man has two finals, finals MVPs. He's trying to get a third one or at least contribute to another championship. And so if the Nuggets could stick it to him on Christmas Day, that would make yeah, me very happy. Yeah, we always want to beat the Suns, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Both teams involved, whether, whether they win or lose, really give you an idea of their ceiling because you know all the guys are playing really hard. And I know that we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, later as well, but the NBA is trying to make it so at least these high profile, as they call it, national TV games aren't being played as back to backs or like the second night of a back to back by either team so that teams, you know, players have, you know, adequate rest <laughs> yeah. before them. So at least there aren't like massive like rest disadvantages or anything like that. You know, we saw last year, what was it? The Bucks faced the Celtics and the Celtics were on that back to back. Uh, after I think it was after their overtime loss to the or overtime win against the Wolves and they traveled to Milwaukee and they were down 50 at halftime and ESPN had to switch the stream over to just some other game. Um, so I think they're trying to avoid that. But yeah, with uh, with these big marquee games, Christmas Day games, um, especially season openers, like both teams are you know, still maybe trying to find their footing. Like Christmas is around, you know, like you said, still beginning of the season, but we're starting to approach like being in the middle of the season. Teams are basically starting to solidify who they are and you can get an idea of like how good these teams actually are on both ends of the floor. So I'm looking forward to that. 
Yeah, that's a interesting point about this whole schedule broadly is that the NBA is really leaning into trying to not have those scenarios where there's a big matchup everyone wants to watch and one of them was on a back-to-back, so then they're resting a star player. They already had rest rules for stars implemented last season. This is another like scheduling-specific strategy that I hope yes. works to create It would some be great if they, games. like, sometimes guys just need to rest. As it turns out, they're not going to put on national TV anyway, then, you know, then it is yeah. what it is. And I've always been interested in the NBA trying to figure out how to make their product more engaging. They have so many games, so it's harder to sell the high stakes of some of them, even though the hardcore right. fans get that. How can they attract more of the casual fans? And those are games that they can definitely do that. But everyone's really excited, I think, about how the national TV games got divvied up this season for the most part. I think the Nuggets actually got around the same number, a little bit fewer I think teams like the Pacers, the Wolves, um, got more national TV games by mm-hmm. a by a substantial number. I know I was listening to um, some of the Wolves guys talking about uh, being really excited about 17 national TV games if you exclude NBA TV. But one of the densest um, stretches of national TV games for the Denver Nuggets comes around uh right after the all-star break starting with february 22nd uh versus the lakers the bucks suns thunder thunder and the reason i wanted to point out this stretch is that a lot of people talk about statement week or statement weeks we had one stretch of you know really important games especially versus the east last year in january we had the game against philly there was the celtics game in boston that was really big and high profile everyone was talking about it afterward and then there was another statement week i guess you could say coming out of the all-star break where it was a lot more west teams but they also faced the celtics again at home in that stretch Um, i think they faced the knicks at home also um in that stretch so within it's more like a statement fortnight (laughs) if you will. And so this stretch here of national TV games kind of covers the equivalent of that second statement week last year, except it's a lot more games. Every single game in this stretch is versus a team that made the playoffs, except they faced Detroit (laughs) in this stretch, but every other team. Oh, and the wizards. Wizards. Yeah. Right. But Every other team is a playoff team from either conference. It's actually mostly Western conference teams, high profile. And when you think about the seeding battle in the Western conference, every single one of these games is going to matter to both teams a lot because every, every win counts, every toss up win, like two good teams, anybody could win is going to matter a lot for those seeding margins in a conference where, uh, I believe. There were three games separating the eighth seed from the fifth seed. And that's the difference between being in the play-in, obviously. In the case of Dallas, they got out of the play-in and they were able to eventually win the conference. Meanwhile, both play-in teams that that came into the playoffs through the play-in lost in the first round as, you know, as they should because they're going to be playing higher seeds. This stretch is definitely interesting and pretty brutal when I'm looking at it. The Pacers are no slouch, and that's a road yep. game. The Bucks, I don't even like. There are even some teams where I don't know how they'll necessarily look because this is after the All Star and the trade deadline and all that. So that's that's exactly right. You know, Lakers, and like last year, the the Mavs came out of the trade deadline like the hottest team in the NBA. Yeah, they were winning games at a ridiculous rate. And I mean, <laughs> trades and all that we've been talking. We've been talking about the CBA and how you know difficult it is to fit these rosters together, and we're still in the early stages of that, where I think it may be harder to make splash trades because the salaries are harder to like fit together. But you never know; like the Lakers could look different. I don't. I mean, the Celtics are not going to be different. <laughs> the Kings, maybe not. They kind of already made a trade. Suns potentially could do a deadline deal. No, I think I think OKC is. I mean, they much could, the but same. they like they're in the same position as the Celtics over the second apron that's true but like let's say the suns are just sucking it up the first half of the season do they do something like right. weird i don't know okay see i think will look the same minnesota will look mostly the same golden state who knows like they could be 
maybe different. You and never know. now that you mentioned Golden State, they're another team that did not make the playoffs last year. So they're That's in true. this stretch, they're grouped along with Detroit, Sacramento, Golden State, and the Washington Wizards, yeah. right? So but, I think yeah. when we get to the stretch, it's going to be really important for the Warriors and the Kings especially those games because the it's going to matter a lot for those teams that need to make sure they're not playing teams two years in a row. Yeah. They, I I would imagine pretty much every team wants to avoid that, especially Steph now who's, you know, I'm sure he's sick of, you know, getting eliminated in these weird games where anything can happen. So yeah, you got to like find a way to stay motivated in the West. Every game matters. It's splitting hairs in terms of the record and the seeding for the most part. The season, the Nuggets won the title. They were, pretty much running away with a one seed but i don't know that we'll see that unless okc like they're young and just like stacked so i could see them maybe like getting a decent lead on the one seed but we have that weird back-to-back in oklahoma city only thing i thought about this was despite the fact that it's two games on the road against them we don't have to travel in between so it's like you travel you play the game and then you just go back chill and then go back and play which hopefully helps I think Ryan Blackburn said on his show that the like average seeding of the all the teams we play on the second night of the back to back is like ten, the tenth seed. So it's more like if you put Oklahoma City, that'd probably bring it down to like twelve. Yeah, so exactly. eleven or twelve, right? Because I think they're they were the one seed. That this one in particular is probably one of the harder teams on a back to back that we'll be playing all season. I mean, they're the one seed. So I'd rather play them than Minnesota on a back to back, I think, because of the matchup. But they're still like a hard team. So I mean Malone compared playing Oklahoma City every game they play, it's like a root canal, right? Yeah. Well now it's <laughs> so... even worse. That was like back when we thought they were just like kind of scrappy up right. and coming. Now they're seen as like legit. And they got even scrappier, right? Because you could say a lot of like good things about Josh Giddy, but I don't think scrappy is a word that you would I uh, used to describe him necessarily. Not that no. he isn't. It's just like if you replaced him with Alex Caruso, the scrappy index has has increased substantially. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. So the next thing I want to talk about the schedule is the travel. The Nuggets are traveling roughly 44,000 miles at this point. The, I, was, I was using the uh, calculations made by Positive Residual, which hasn't accounted yet for the two games that will be added either in the season tournament knockout rounds or the makeup games that are there for the teams that don't make the knockout rounds. And the reason that I even point that out is that that puts the Nuggets at roughly the, I think they're in the the top third for most miles traveled. They're usually in that top half because they're in the Western Conference, they're in the Northwest Division. The teams in the Northwest Division are particularly spaced out from each other and from the rest of the NBA. So they're going to travel the most miles usually and there's only like small differences year to year in that. But actually, I looked it up, and last year, they traveled a lot more miles, and it was closer to the top of the league uh, overall. We'll see what that looks like when they add in, again, those makeup games. The year that they won the title, they actually traveled the most miles in the NBA, um, and it wasn't particularly close. Was that just regular they, season, or did that include playoffs? Regular season. Okay. Regular season. So that was interesting. So it's like, okay, well, they were still able to win the one seed that year, even though it was with only 53 games and they were fine. They rested the guys down the stretch. So, you know, that probably like they got, they had to travel a lot, but maybe they didn't play as many games, especially like Jokic in particular, didn't play as many games. MPJ didn't play as many games as he did last year, that year either. I wanted to bring this up because this is usually the, um, the thing that the, that the schedule nerds care the most about when they're comparing, you know, the logistics of different team schedules who gets the most disadvantage. I think last year that was the Clippers by far. Like it wasn't close and the Clippers had the, to travel the most miles in their schedule. And you can imagine that being the case in particular because they were still sharing that arena with the Lakers. And so they just have all kinds of wonky stuff where they can't quite always optimize their schedule for you know minimizing travel, things like that, that the league is um, trying to do to some extent. Now they have their own arena. So they're actually like nowhere near the top in travel, which is interesting. You know, the year that they had the most travel, they were still able to win a lot of regular season games, get the one seed in the West, yeah. and win Almost a title. take the last month off, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, you always wonder how travel affects teams. You would imagine it would suck because you're traveling, you're on a plane, you're tired, you're getting in late. But I guess if you have the talent and a good enough team, 
they're gonna rise to the occasion. I want. I don't know where that ranks total with the other teams. It's top third, but I think it's like it's around that like twenty, uh, not twentieth, but I guess like tenth in, in total, okay. in total travel. Uh, the question I had about this that I want to talk to you about, you know, even though I said like, hey, they had the most travel the uh, a couple of years ago and they still want the title, but you know, traveling a lot is still not good for you. Like, lots of studies have talked about how travel is not good for your health. It can potentially make um, certain types of athletes more prone to injury with like more travel because of how much it drains your body's like recovery functions, messes with your sleep schedule, all of that mm-hmm. stuff. Right. I don't think that, I think that that's pretty intuitive. The Eastern conference teams were consistently at the bottom of this chart. When I was looking back through a couple of seasons, the two teams that were always like bottom three, I guess, in miles travel were like the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Toronto Raptors. The Raptors are like always right there because all those um, teams in their division are like right next to each other in the yeah. Northeast, right? It's interesting that Toronto is there instead of one of the other teams in that division because they're even closer to each yeah, other. Yeah, they're super close. I wanted to ask, like, do you think that the East has yet another <laughs> systemic advantage due to this thing with all these teams proximity that makes it so they don't have to travel as much as the West teams and just makes their lives even easier than it already is because they're in the Eastern Conference. (laughs) It's a really interesting point. I don't actually know what like the data says about traveling and how that affects like win total season to season. I'm sure there's experts out there who know that. Like if Matt was here, he'd probably know. (laughs) Right. Um, Well, the thing is, is it's weird because it's like you'd, you'd say the East is always kind of worse like there's worse teams so if, if they have to travel less shouldn't they be able to consistently put a better product You'd on the think court so, but, but it th- actually works in favor of my anti-east agenda because it's like you have this advantage why aren't you better <laughs> yeah well maybe that just makes it like the teams that are good really yeah. separate themselves from the east teams that are bad so yeah if you're ever going to have have an upset on a top east team if you're like middle of the pack or lower in the east with like uh you have a home game and they travel and they're tired you just have less of an advantage there because they're just not traveling as much like they just flew to detroit from philly rather than you know across the country into uh, multiple different True. time zones it might be why western conference road trips are so brutal for eastern conference teams too because it's you're like off you're obviously time. traveling you're playing not at home like you would on any kind of road trip but you're traveling even more than you do on road trips within your conference whereas for western conference teams traveling east is like difficult of course but they're used to traveling longer distances because they travel to other western conference teams that are already like pretty far apart from each other just because of geographically like the west is very spaced out we've Mm -hmm. got the great plains We've got the Rocky Mountains. We've got lots of other mountain ranges as well. Uh, Got to go down to Texas, going over to the the Western Front, right? All this unexplored territory. And it actually, you know, while we're on this, I'll just like skip down to another question that I had. The NBA is trying to expand eventually once they like finally final out this uh, media rights deal and finish this lawsuit or whatever legal action with, um, with TNT and all of the teams that have been discussed for this, uh, for expansion seriously anyway, are in the West. They've talked about Seattle because they want to make up for taking away the Seattle uh, Supersonics. Las Vegas seems like the only lock for sure. Although I think Seattle like has it. Mexico City has been discussed as well. They're all in the West. And so it would be the West gaining two teams and then another Western Conference team would move When you think about this travel aspect, it's actually not that like, it's not that logistically sound to add both of the expansion teams to the Western Conference. But the other consideration is obviously like balance between the conferences. And I think that the Western Conference could definitely use a couple more tanking teams (laughs) just, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, you know, just to make up for that. But yeah, what are your thoughts on, on just that aspect with, uh, with expansion and what it would mean for more it would be more travel not just for other western conference teams that have to play these new teams that are going to join the west but also the east that will have to travel to either seattle or you know vegas is more central so i think that's probably why it's like the safe choice also but i think mexico city would be a dope expansion team personally Mm -hmm. but it's also super it'd be the furthest away of any of them 
So you're saying it would be logistically sound to add a team to the East just because it's easier to travel on everyone on the whole? Yeah. But I also, like, I'd rather go the balanced route. Like, if they added Seattle or Vegas, mm -hmm. it's easier for, like, the Suns to travel there or California teams to travel to Vegas. And it's easier for Portland to go to Seattle, maybe easier for Sacramento to go to Seattle. Like, there's some wiggle room there. It's not as easy as the compactness of the East necessarily, but I, I don't think the NBA is going to care about that. They're going to go for the market. No, I don't think yeah, so either. Um, for the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're going to go for Vegas or the Sonics or whatever. So, Perfect. And that just happens to be in the West, which I'm happy about. And then they will just move one team to the East, which there are some teams. Yeah, there are some teams you could argue. <laughs> it's either Memphis or Minnesota, I would say, would move to the East. Yeah. I guess Tennessee's, or, you know, Memphis probably closer geographically. So logistically. Uh, they're pretty close. Yeah. They're pretty close, actually. But, that's but more, I, think, I think it is Memphis. That's a little more stretched out than they currently are. So that just adds a little more travel around the East, which I think is more you know what fair yeah i guess <laughs> then you balance out the travel between the conferences too if they have to travel a little bit further for like one more team that's in the conference yeah like if they put it in minnesota i think that would make sense and would stretch them out a little bit but i don't know the reality is is that traveling in the nba and putting on a, t a league like this is just tough it's tough to schedule it it's tough to travel there's a lot of games people already want less games yeah. So it's just like a reality true. of the situation. And it seems like for the most part, unless I miss some fan bases, people seem generally happy about their schedules. I don't know. I haven't looked around. Nuggets fans, I, I haven't think, seen anyone unhappy about their schedules. Yeah, I guess that's a better way to phrase say. it. Which is different than last year where I heard a lot of complaining from a lot of different teams, including or like fans of different teams, including the Nuggets, about their schedule last year, in particular because of how back-to-back -back and like second nights of back-to-back -back heavy it was early on in the season mm -hmm. so even though they have more back-to-backs this year and we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more it seems like it's more evenly distributed across the season and like you said the back-to-backs are versus um sort of lighter competition yeah. than oh. they seem to be last year but yeah Okay, so I wanted to bring up the three biggest home stretches in the schedule. So the first one is at the beginning, starting with November 2nd. There are five games, starting with the Jazz, that are in Denver, just in a row. That's a beautiful stretch of at home, win these games. There's another game versus Oklahoma City, so it's interesting. We have OKC kind of twice within a about a two week span and then we don't play them again until March right both of those games are at home we want to try to win those get our division tiebreakers out of the way if we can but it's this is an interesting stretch I think because you've got two teams that you should definitely beat in the Jazz and the Raptors that are probably going to be probably going to be tanking you never know what the Jazz and then you have three playoff teams in Oklahoma City the Heat and Dallas Mavericks are obviously a great team. They won the Western Conference um, in the playoffs last year, but they're all at home. So it's just a good stretch to start to build your cushion early in the season. The next stretch, which actually ties this one, is toward the end of the season on March 24th. We have Chicago, which should win that game. The Bucks, which uh, is kind of a 50-50 because we don't know how Milwaukee is actually going to be next year, but we tend to do well against the Bucks at home. The Jazz again. Minnesota, which is going to be a toss-up. Like, those teams are just, it's a tough matchup. Both teams play really hard. They're both really good. And then San Antonio, which, you know, we've seen how hard Wemby plays versus good players. He definitely takes the, mat the Jokic matchup very seriously. But these are all games, again, that you should win. So you have this opportunity at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season, to go on these mini runs to try to run up your win total. Maybe at the beginning of the season, it's about building a cushion for what's going to go on in the middle with more road heavy schedules at the end of the season or toward the end of the season. It's an opportunity to maybe go on like one final stretch run of like play hard win these games and, you know, maybe let the chips fall where they may with the last few games of the series of the season that are kind of home and road, home and road so that they can decide to just get some rest, but put themselves in a position to get the best seed that they 
can that's like reasonable. Before I go to the last stretch, uh, the last stretch of home games, what do you think about that kind of framework of those two stretches at the beginning of the end, just like building cushion versus like, okay, let's try to run it up at the end before we go on a little bit of rest. Like that's how I would be looking at it if I were like on the coaching staff trying to recommend like a way to like a rhythm to the season. Like that's what I would say about those stretches. Yeah, I think it's important to identify stretches like that schedules are always like this where you have stretches that are more in your favor and stretches that are more difficult and we talked about a, the kind of difficult kind of compact stretch and it's important to keep that context as a fan because sometimes you're just not going to be winning those games and sometimes you're going to go on stretches and you don't want to necessarily overestimate how a team is playing when they're on an easy right. stretch and you don't want to you know act like the world is falling when a bad stretch is happening. And it's right. I do think right. I'm not, you know, there are clear signs of this during the season with every team where you can look at their schedule and be like, damn, they didn't really play anybody or wow. They had a brutal stretch of games right there. And that's why they're playing bad. And they're going to bounce back and play better at the end of the season or whatever. I think like that's a legitimate real thing as someone who I kind of don't care as much about the nuances of scheduling. Cause I'm just like, every game is the game. And like, I hope you win. Except for back-to-backs, I kind of care more about that. These things are real. So I like yeah. pointing out these things, especially the end, because the end of season stretch last year kind of screwed us. So I want to at least get the three seed. That's like kind of where I sit. So we'll see how the Nuggets, where they're at, coming into like the last month and hopefully are in a good spot to where they don't have to push super hard for like a, a least top three seed. So there's this nice stretch here before and after the all-star break actually where leading up to the all-star break the only road game we have is versus phoenix and then coming out of the all-star break it is four home games in a row versus all teams that we should beat especially at home in the blazers twice charlotte and then the lakers yeah these are the kind of stretches like you said that you know the te teams are going to be playing like a little bit differently at different stretches in the season unless you're the boston celtics where you're just at any given point winning 75 percent of your games <laughs> regardless of like what stretch of the season it's in. if you're in the western conference <laughs> you really want to take these stretches of home games if you're a good home team like the nuggets are seriously because you can really build up a either a cushion for like a bad stretch, like I said, or a lead that you could use um, to rest guys down the stretch of the season later. So in these stretches of like five games at home versus, you know, teams that you should beat for the most part, and maybe there's like one or two tough matchups in there. I think it's reasonable to want the team to go either five and zero or four and one, like want that, like want that slash expect it. If your expectation is like, we're trying to build a cushion or like run it up like this. You have to go beyond your normal sort of uh, mm. win percentage that you would your your pace that you would were at for most of the season, right? Whereas during the road stretches, which we are going to talk about, actually, we could go to the longest road trip now, which is not that long. If you go to January twenty fifth, uh, starting uh, at Minnesota, uh, we have a five game road trip, which is the longest road trip on the entire schedule, which is pretty sweet. I think they had something like a seven game road trip was the longest last season. And it's not uncommon, I think, or wasn't uncommon last season for East Coast road trips or Eastern Conference road trips for Western Conference teams to be like seven games just because that is more convenient for travel. If you could pack them in in these like longer chunks, then you don't have to like keep flying back and fourth between the coasts but in this case it starts with minnesota maybe that is a signal that minnesota is going to be the team moving to the eastern conference <laughs> if they see that this is like the most convenient uh you know way for travel to go uh then we get to chicago at new york at philly at charlotte one of the things that i noted during this uh this schedule stretch is that this game at philadelphia is actually the second matchup versus philly this year i believe last season and the season before the series against Philly started with Denver at Philly. And then the game in Denver doesn't happen until afterward. And we know yeah. sort of what that means for the dynamic of, you know, Jokic goes to Philly. They lose a game in Philadelphia. Joel gets to brag about it. Joel then doesn't play in Denver. And then <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's story. a thing too. Um, but that's a difficult stretch of games actually, because you only have two games against teams that you should beat 
and they're also on the road, right? Versus Chicago and Charlotte. But then the other three are Minnesota, always tough. New York, always tough. Philadelphia, always tough, yeah. right? And so that's a road trip where I'm like, I'd be happy with three and two. Like, mm-hmm. take those two for sure against Chicago and, Sh- Chicago and Charlotte. And then one of the three versus mini. Ideally, it'd be mini because you get the division and the and the conference adds to the division and conference tiebreakers. But if you can get one of the ones versus New York or Philly instead, that'd be fine. And anything above that is cake. So sort of setting expectations for these different stretches of the season, like reasonable expectations. This isn't about saying like the Nuggets, you know, they would never win these games because they're on the road and they're versus these like super tough Eastern Conference teams. Like they can absolutely win basically every game they play, but they probably won't. (laughs) Right. And so that's just like, that's how I'm thinking about these different stretches of the season. Yeah. So um, the last like nitpicky thing before we talk about tiebreakers that I wanted to point out was actually that OKC back to back. It's actually one of six baseball series that the Nuggets have this season where they have two games in a row versus the same team called a baseball series because baseball does this all the time. Will has the word baseball muted on his Twitter. So I don't know (laughs) that you either know that or care about that at all. (laughs) But it's one of the things that baseball tries to do to to reduce travel. Often they're in the same place. In the case of this OKC game, that one's in the same place. So yeah. Will is showing here. It's the case with uh, Dallas, oh, Dallas, both in Dallas. We actually only have one of these baseball series that is in two different places. It is the one versus the San Antonio. Oh, no, we have two because there's the one versus the Spurs that's home in Denver and then on the road in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And then the other one versus the Suns in December, where we have, uh, are those yeah, the two Christmas in a row? One. They are. So again, at home and then on the road. The other ones are going to be in the same place. Yeah, like um, we have Memphis, Memphis one in November, exactly. both away with the day in between. So they're going to get some good time in Memphis. I'm curious what your thoughts are on these baseball series. This isn't the first year they've done them. We had, to my recollection, one baseball series last season that I can remember that was versus the Blazers and it was both both games were in Denver and then I remember there were these two like big national one of them was a national TV game but it was the Spurs at Phoenix and the Spurs won both of those games it was early in the season everyone's like oh my god Wemby and everyone was like oh my god Phoenix you know going on and it was so funny that I want to point out the Spurs versus Suns one in particular because in the first game, the Suns were out to this giant lead. They let it dwindle. Then the Spurs beat them in the clutch. In the second game, the Spurs got out to a massive lead, like 30 points at half. And then they let it dwindle. And then they were able to hang on in the clutch. But I was like, oh, did like the Suns make adjustments between these two games since they're playing the same team back to back? It's kind of relevant for two game or two teams in Denver and OKC that are going to play each other in the last two games of their season series. They're in the same division. They're teams that could meet each other in the playoffs. Do you think that they're, these baseball series are going to provide more opportunities for coaches and teams to try out different adjustments, try out different, you know, lineups, rotations, whatever it is, or it's just going to be like any two regular season games in a row? Yeah, that's my big question. I think early on in the season against you know, non-playoff teams like Pelicans and in, in January, the Spurs, I think less of that yeah. will happen. But like against the Dallas or or like Memphis, I think you should probably try to suss them out a little bit because we don't, I think we all expect they're going to be good, but we don't really know what they're like right now. And I'm not an NBA coach. I don't know how Malone views like showing your hand versus just playing your base offense and defense. I think that Malone tries out very specific things in particular matchups like we saw one that stands out a lot to me was the game in boston versus boston last year where he went to a seven and a half man rotation mm, yeah, with that one. ag and he switched up who like some of the um the matchups like did some cross matching on defense particularly in the second half of that game and that kind of thing and the same thing with the game in Denver, although the it wasn't as tight a rotation, um, but changed up some of the some of the defensive scheme. 
in that game. So I think that he's willing to do it for particular matchups. Yeah. And not maybe not others. I think, yeah, throwing something at them just to see how they play it. And granted, they could completely mm. switch up right. assignments. Right, like you're also information gathering. And sometimes to do that, you have to show your hand a little bit. Yeah, and maybe like the defensive assignments, they like maybe Jason Tatum isn't playing, you know, a specific matchup in the regular season against us. But in the playoffs, they'll put him somewhere to like confuse the coverages. That could happen because Tatum's very like versatile on defense, and that's like what screwed them. Yeah, Mavs, that's something the Celtics also did, right? So the the adjustment that they made in the finals versus the Mavs, where they put Tatum on the center, yeah. or were willing to switch Tatum onto the center, or like had him on on Jamal, or maybe they had him on Luca, or had him on Lively to try to stifle the pick and roll. They actually did that in the game in Denver as well. So mm -hmm. you know, like some some of these teams are willing to do things a little bit differently in certain matchups in certain moments for sure so there are definitely interesting you could even say with okc that game that came down to the wire and that they were able to pull off in denver dagnalt went to a double big lineup in the second half of that game he benched giddy and had jalen williams big jalen williams starting in that spot or in within the lineup so that they had chet and big j will on the floor at the same time. That was something they didn't do in that first matchup that they had in the season, but it was difficult to necessarily tell the progression because like months had passed between those games. Whereas here in the case of a baseball series, you'll be able to see adjustments game to game pretty clearly uh, just because it'll be like fresher in your mind. I think Malone is always balancing trying to win the next game. He always says like as a head coach or just trying to win the next game. They learned this lesson that maybe they shouldn't have pu pushed for the one seed, or at least that's what they said. Are they going to? Yeah, they said like, a lot of things. They also yeah. said that down the stretch of the season and, you know, did yeah, otherwise. Exactly. Like, we're not going to care about the one seed. It's health. But then after the season, everyone was like, yeah, we are pushing for the one seed. It's like the regular season almost matters less because you want to just focus on being healthy for the playoffs. But you kind of can be healthy for the playoffs if you take the regular season seriously. So it's like, it's especially weird. early on. Exactly. The Nuggets have different lineup this year we've talked about them wanting to maybe be more versatile on offense i don't think they should be afraid to show some stuff if it means winning more games i think also like the nuggets have played the suns in the playoffs before the kd suns they're different now with beal we haven't played them but i'm not that worried about them okay see yeah. thunder is a different story we haven't played them in the playoffs we played the wolves multiple times thunder and wolves are like the two teams i'm most worried about so I think there's less concern of like showing your hand versus the wolves because like these teams have played each other in the playoffs a lot. Oh my I think we, god! I think we kind of yeah, know they've played twelve <laughs> yeah. games against each other in the play in a playoff setting. I think that in the last you, couple of years, plus that, every regular season game, they play each other four times every year. Uh, yeah, you want to see Mike and Jamal do well against the wolves, so try to do some stuff to set them up. But then, does that show the wolves ways to? counter it look we talked about in like during that playoff series the wolves are their the wolves ball pressure is going to crumble the question was when are the nuggets going to start doing the things that they need to do to take advantage of it we finally started to see them do that in that game three they had three game winning streak against the wolves finally in game six the wolves ditch the ball pressure or they they, they, they don't like ditch it court, but they start yeah. to be way more um selective about it with when where which matchups right keeping it on Jamal, but basically not doing it on anybody else because you shouldn't mm -hmm. uh, for the, all the reasons that we talked about. But yeah, like you said, all of the like adjustments that each team is going to make or can make, they have. And it's more about, I think it's more, it's so much more about execution now yeah. than, um, yeah, and just than being scheme. Healthy and... Like, and part of that is like, okay, when is it time to move to the new scheme? But it's not about like, oh, we need to come up with a whole new like creative thing, like way to like counter this like revolutionary concept of like figuring out someone that your rim protector can roam off of. It's like, okay, there are specific things that you can do to counter this. Now it's about everyone on the floor working to execute that, right? I just wanted to, to just give a couple of little notes about the games versus our division rivals. Three main things here. The first is that there are no division rivals in our IST group. Part of that is because they were the top three seeds in the West in the case of Minnesota, Denver, and OKC. So that means they 
uh, wouldn't be in the same IST group. Obviously, there was a chance that Utah or Portland could also be there, but they just weren't. They were in the other groups. So that means that there's no possibility that we play any of our division rivals five times, the four times that are normal, plus the makeup game potentially, right? We don't know which teams are going to play on the makeup game, but it's not going to be a division team because they're not in our IST group. The next thing is that um, all four games versus the Minnesota Timberwolves are on national TV. NBA is really trying to play up this rivalry. Um, I think that's significant because they obviously played a very strange yet competitive uh, in some ways, not competitive in others, playoff series uh, this past year. And they played a competitive-ish in other ways playoff series the year before. <laughs> you know, close gentleman sweep, as one would say. The fact that those are going to be on national TV, I think, matters a lot. Because Ant likes the spotlight. Jamal likes the spotlight. The Nuggets take those games. They tend to take those games very seriously, right? We had lots of big marquee moments on those, um, those, pr those primetime games from the Nuggets last year. Versus Boston, both times they had, you know, Jokic's game winner in the big comeback versus Golden State, of course. Every Lakers game, because <laughs> I think every Lakers game is on national TV, it seems, every Nuggets Lakers game. The Timberwolves are a very confident young team, so they're going to be playing, I think, especially hard in those national TV games, especially because they're a team that saw a big spike in their national TV games this season like we said so they're going to want to really show out and like show that like they deserve mm -hmm. these and they deserve even more than they got the last bullet point i have here is just that the nuggets only have two back-to-backs against any team in the division so like you said even for people that don't necessarily care about the schedule like yourself you care enough that like on a back-to-back -back, you're willing to give them generally a pass unless they're like just <laughs> Well, unless you're Tim Leckler. Losing Lechler. to teams that, or unless you're Tim Leckler, <laughs> right? Those two back-to-backs are the, the one versus OKC that we talked about. That's part of that baseball series in Oklahoma City. And the other one is versus the Jazz at home. And I think it's one of the November games. Yeah, so that's all I had to say about the division games. But let's talk about, let's talk about whether the Nuggets are contenders. Well, Yeah, sure. When it comes to the schedule, I think Malone has always been somebody who is trying to gain as much as you can like motivating the team to care about divisions and mm -hmm. motivating them to care about back-to-backs i just like i like the way that malone handles that and i think the nuggets team in general are gonna be a little bit more motivated and like energized this season based on what they said and i think jamal is has his prove it season again i think christian brown has a prove it season i think everyone like p watt and straw there so I think the motivation and energy is going to be there. Can I just make a comment about the Jamal thing? You're talking sure. about him having yeah. a perfect season. I still don't think that they're going to go into the season without Jamal having signed an extension. But it is notable that last week we got some photos of practice at, uh, at the practice facility. Jamal was there in Denver following his Olympic run almost immediately, right? <laughs> because... The Olympics ended, I believe, on, was it Monday last week? The women played their final. And then um, by the middle of the week, J Jamal is in Denver. Obviously, Canada's Olympics ended a little early, so maybe they flew back early as well. But he, he was there, and we still haven't gotten any news about an extension. I don't know if he's still in Denver. But I think it's notable that we haven't gotten that news yet because mm -hmm. it means one or both sides are not happy with whatever it. deal is on the table yeah and he had an exception because he played in the olympics so no one else no other no other starters are just hanging out in denver right now well yeah. i guess you could say christian he's, oh, yeah. he's, an, he's a projected starter i was kind of surprised to see that he was in denver there's no reason i i think like maybe that's just me i i don't know how exactly these deals are worked out but i don't generally think you have to be physically present to negotiate these things especially when you mm -hmm. it's not like he's spent a bunch of time away it's, this isn't a free agent who <clears> they're <throat> thinking about signing to a max contract like he's been there he's yeah. he's on the team already maybe this has something to do with like wanting to see jamal there practicing like getting in shape whatever i again i think it's notable that there's been no news about the extension yet because you'd think if he's flying to Denver immediately after the Olympics, it's specifically to 
work on negotiating that deal and his representation as well as everything from the team has been suggesting that it's all about it's about the olympics and after the olympics we'll deal with that then the olympics are over and i don't think i would have been thinking about it in like this such an immediate term if we hadn't seen him in denver right after the olympics i'd still be thinking about it in the back of my head but the fact that he was there and we still don't have the news is why you know it's at the forefront i would have been thinking about it just because of the time that's already gone by because everyone was saying they're just waiting till after the olympics and then they're going to sign it maybe everything's still fine maybe they're negotiating i really have no idea but i think the fact that it hasn't happened yet is worth thinking about and if you're one of those people who are skeptical about how Jamal's going to look, just seeing him in the gym in Nuggets gear is a good sign. Like, that's what you want to see. Like, he could be working out elsewhere, like in Toronto and like it's doing true. his own thing and maybe would, wouldn't have ever seen it. Maybe I'm too like nice, but I was always of the mindset that the Nuggets shouldn't try to put in all these stipulations and the uh, extension and just treat Jamal like a champion and a pro. So handle your business and treat him like a grown up essentially and <laughs> i mean i i, I think, mean a grown up they're giving 200 million dollars to i know the money is what makes it more like hey we're giving you this money we have to be really careful about how we're allocating that yeah you can like nitpick and ask should you know is jamal gonna live yeah. up to this max i get how like you can try and nickel and dime this deal potentially to like save something around the margins it's jamal murray just hand him what he deserves and be an organization well, that's that the takes question care of your when you say hand him what he deserves. One, I, I don't full, know that everyone agrees with that full, statement. And number two, I think the definition of what he deserves is being is what's probably being argued right now. Yeah, that's just where I am on Jamal. Like I'm not into nitpicking what he's doing and like saying you have to like have weigh ins and like whatever the hell to incentivize him. I just believe that he'll he's smart enough and mature enough to know what he's supposed to do. You know, like just treat him like you believe in him. I don't know. He plays and... better when he's angry, so maybe it maybe that'll <laughs> work. I agree with you about like the whole stipulations things. I think that it actually just gets messier because they offered the full max. This was the number that I predicted they would go with, like during the season. I was like, okay, they're gonna give Jamal a max since he he didn't make all NBA. He's not eligible for super max, but. He's going to be eligible for max money. That's what they're going to give. I think the fact of the of the way that the playoffs went and how they ended uh, just left a bad, bad taste in everybody's mouth. That plus, you say that it would be easy to trade him if they gave him a max and like things didn't work out. And like I don't necessarily think that's true because if you give him a max, that deal is tied to the salary cap. It's not a it is a set number, but it's kind of it's kind of tied to the cap right now. And it's going to be like the max money that it can be over the next few years because the salary cap is going to be going up as much as it possibly can over the next few years. I do think the teams have been a lot more cautious about particularly those second stars like we've talked about, whether it was signing them or trading for them, unless you're the Philadelphia 76ers, I guess, because they their whole plan was cap space and all that. And so I, I understand the hesitancy from from that position with the number, but I agree with you. Like the whole thing with all the stipulations and all that doesn't really make sense to me because if you wanted those to be in there, I don't know how it's even helpful to you, honestly, for those to be in there. If anything, trying to get like the number down would have been more helpful because it offers more like roster building flexibility. Things with stipulations and like partial guarantees and all that doesn't actually do anything for the team because if he's not fulfilling that stuff it's not great it's still difficult to trade him regardless of any like weird like stipulations Mm -hmm. that are i can't imagine what would Mm -hmm. be in that contract that would make a team less nervous about taking on that deal the thing that would make him less nervous than less nervous is like him just playing up to the contract which could happen regardless of what the number is if that makes yeah right i'm just one to believe in like showing that you trust somebody when you're working together in an organization than like these weird fake motivational clauses in a contract. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It just gets more messy, right? But the reason Um, we're talking about Jamal so much is because he's like the biggest factor in this are the Nuggets contenders, I would argue. If he's playing really well, the Nuggets are going to be contenders with him and Jokic. I don't care who the rest of the players are on the roster. And maybe that's a little bit of a oversimplification because ag and mpj are really important i just wanted to give 
a couple of stats on the Jamal plus Jokic on the floor thing. Cause like you said, if those two guys are playing, they're healthy and they're playing at their best, then that's what makes the Nuggets a contending team. Over the last three seasons, Jokic and Jamal have been over a plus 12 on the floor net rating together. 20 to, uh, in 2020 to 2021, they were a plus 12.1 on the floor together. In 2023, the championship season, they were plus 12.7. I skipped 22, obviously. That was the year that Jamal missed. And last season, they were a plus 15.7 net on the floor together. So we just need to bring back peanut butter and jelly, people. <laughs> yeah, it really... God, we were so unstoppable when they were going off in the playoffs. Eight, obviously, the other players are important. KCP was important. So I get why people are selling their nugget stock as Hoop Collective just did. And, um, you know... I don't blame people for not believing that the Nuggets are going to win the title next season. I would probably even be surprised if the Nuggets won the title coming into the season. But I still believe they're contenders. How you define contenders, I guess everyone's different. Like, you have to be in the finals or you have to be in the conference finals. I think it's more like, no, you, yeah, you, you have, have to get, get you have to, to the at least, finals. you have to at least be perceived to get to the Western Conference finals. Because I could see the Thunder and the Mavs and the Wolves and Nuggets getting there <laughs> i think that's i think that's about right i need to think about it a little bit more because there's a couple of teams at the, at the top of the west where i'm thinking about where they'd be regular season wise where i'm still not sure if i consider them contenders because of some pretty glaring flaws we haven't talked about like the fringe players that so much depends on with the depth of christian brown and Watt, russ we've talked about like kind of our expectations around when the russ signing was announced I'm just hoping they're serviceable enough to spell the starters. We already win a season that we didn't win a title. So it's like, okay, we had our off year. But at the same time, are you really going to expect us to win the title again this season? What are the realistic expectations? I think well, we have to... I don't think that a title is a realistic expectation for any team unless you're the Boston Celtics because you're basically guaranteed to win That's your true. conference. No one is guaranteed to win the Western Conference, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and in any other year, like even if the Celtics weren't there, um, even if the West was a little bit less competitive, winning a title is really hard. So I don't I wouldn't call that a realistic expectation. But in terms of what makes a team a contender, I don't see the Nuggets as any less of a contender than any team in the West. And I definitely see them as more of a contender still in my eyes than at least as much of a contender team. as any team in the West. Yeah. And oh, yeah, definitely than most of the East, <laughs> like every team yeah. except Boston, every team yeah. in the East except Boston. And even then, like if they met in the finals, I'm picking Denver. Yeah, I really think it's those top four teams with maybe some surprises where like, who knows, maybe there's an injury to one of those teams. And then Memphis is actually amazing. And then they're like in the top 14. But that but that is something that I, I do want to stress with this question. The idea that you should be selling your Nuggets stock because they got worse while the rest of the West got better. Tell me the Western Conference team that is going to beat the Denver Nuggets, let's say six games, because I think a seven-game series is truly a toss-up. Like, that's what happened. That's why I didn't want the Nuggets to go to game seven last year. Was not a fan. Six-game series or less. Tell me the West team that's going to beat the Nuggets in six games or less. McMahon asked who's guarding the Shays, the Lucas. I can't remember all the players he named. I think he said the LeBrons. The, eight, the John like Morant, the LeBron's, the the John Morant's, and so it's like look, I think he would have I Memphis, think that, I Memphis think that Lakers. PCP is very specifically useful for the Stephs, the Devin Bookers. When I say specifically useful, he was very versatile and, and helpful, but in a way that's like irreplaceable. Like I don't think we're going to be able to guard Steph nearly as well without KCP. I don't think we're going to be able to guard Damian Lillard nearly as well without KCP. John Morant, question mark. I didn't see, just because we didn't see as much of it in the last couple seasons with like, injuries and whatever, when those games actually came around. But we have, like, this. the problem with this team is actually that we have too many, like, defensively oriented point of attack wings and not enough offensively oriented players. I'm not, like, while I'm worried about the defense in certain aspects, I think that losing KCP's defense, downgrading us from being a contender is like a way overreaction regardless of my own critiques of you know that that decision i would understand people selling stock for this season because of course we don't know how the young guys are going to be and you lose kcp sure if you're you know not tuned into the nuggets you know I don't, i'm not going to begrudge you but if you're like saying 
are the best days of Denver contending behind them. That is way too much because I used to see tons of skeptics about LeBron throughout his whole career about is LeBron's best days of contending over because he would go through cycles of like having a really good roster and then maybe not having the best roster and then he would go somewhere else, right? And everyone would say, I'm never betting against LeBron. I'm not seeing that same treatment with Jokic necessarily. Like, I know Wendy said, like, he believes in Jokic so much, so he he's sad that he has to sell his Nuggets stock. Well, that's fine. I would still say I believe in Jokic so much that the Nuggets will be contenders just because he's on the team. He's won playoff games with, like... Run playoff series. Series, yeah, that's what I meant to say. With insanely, <laughs> um, let's say challenged, challenged rosters. Challenged rosters. NBA player challenged rosters. <laughs> For sure. I will never say the Nuggets are not contenders if Jokic is on the team. I think that there's not enough credit being given to MPJ, AG, and what Jamal can be when you know that he's actually healthy and at his best. Even like in a regular season context, like that four-man lineup just kicks ass, right? Yeah. Like that's why they're our core. I do think that part of what's happening is an overrating of some other teams in the West because like I said, in – I could see any team in, say, the top six in the West beating the Nuggets in, say, seven games, which is a toss-up, although I think that Denver should be favored in most of those matchups. But I don't see any team beating them in in six games or less. I I wouldn't favor any team but maybe Minnesota, and even then I would say that series is a toss-up. Yeah, Versus definitely. So my question is, like, regardless of, okay, OKC versus the Nuggets, they have to show me that the additions of Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hardenstein makes them a serious uh, title contender. That has not been shown, right? Just because you add a $27 million a year player, or in the case of the the Philadelphia 76ers added Paul George, everyone is still like skeptical of them, but it doesn't seem like OKC is getting any skepticism whatsoever. And I think they're a great team. I thought they were an awesome team, especially in the regular season last year which is part of why i i think part of what's happening is that okc in particular is their regular season from last year isn't being appreciated for how good they were so everyone's like oh but they were and then they ended up the one seed and they're like they're really good and now they got better i'm like guys you don't know how great they were last year this is going to be a different Mm -hmm. dynamic for this team and then obviously dallas they have a little bit less of a different dynamic because They had most of their big moves at the trade deadline and they got to play with those guys through, you know, the last part of the regular season and through the playoffs, obviously made the finals. They lost Derek Jones Jr., but now they have Najee Marshall and Clay Thompson, right? Like those are also big additions and they're going to be, I think of that as more kind of straight forward upgrades because I don't see any of their moves as fundamentally changing Dallas's play style, but in the case of OKC, they're fundamentally changing their play style when they get rid of Josh Kitty, when they add mm-hmm. Alex Caruso, when they add Isaiah Hardenstein. So I have, I actually have fewer questions about Dallas, although um, I don't know how they're actually going to look in the regular season. Like, are they going to be the world beaters they were post trade deadline, or are they going to be just like another really good Western Conference team that's going to be fighting for a top seed? Mm-hmm. That's why I'm just like, guys, I need you to put these other Western Conference teams in context because the Nuggets are still awesome. They won 57 games last year. Yeah. They were tied for the one seed and just lost that tiebreaker. And I'd argue. On a Shea game winner. And I'd argue not playing our best in the playoffs. So there's a chance that just with a good Jokic and Jamal, that we're still like far and away the best West team. The perception of fans and analysts, whoever, I feel like it's always kind of similar post LeBron on the Cavs and uh, Steph and the KD Warriors at least because that was a different case. But the up-and-coming Nuggets were kind of like a hip, cool team to like, where they were kind of being compared to the Warriors, like built through the draft. Then they kind of showed what they could do, get to the Western Conference Finals and fail. And then people start going, well, actually, can they really do this? Then they win. Then you lose. And then people start saying, well, is their window now closed and it's over for them? And the Thunder, I think, are going to get that same treatment where the expectations were... Not super high because they're so young still. They're playing with house money. They show that they're really good, but no one was expecting them to win the title. So they kind of overachieved. 
this season they're technically better with their additions. The expect expectations are going to be higher this season. A lot of analysts can see potential in new teams. And until they see them lose and how it happens, they won't really start to doubt them. So I think they'll need to see what happens with the Thunder and this playoffs or maybe a couple more. We just saw them lose to Dallas. This is not yeah. how the Nuggets were talked about after they lost to the Lakers in the bubble. Well, I think there were still some people who were like, hey, the Nuggets, they still might be around. Like Jamal was really good. Were they good. Were expected was to really be the good. one seed? What, what, what were they that year? Like the two or three seed? I think there were still people weird. who were like picking the Nuggets to win the West and be the one seed after that. I don't think there was like a ton of can the Nuggets really do this until Jamal got hurt. You and think... actually this year it's more akin to when they lost in the second round to the Blazers because they didn't make the conference finals. The the Thunder didn't make their conference finals. So it's more yeah. akin to when the Nuggets in 2019. Yeah, it's weird. You'd think you'd be more skeptical like you were saying and say that a team needs to show that they can beat the big teams or the teams that have already won championships. I get thinking that they're good too. Like we've actually, we've had this discussion when we like one of the first episodes of the podcast, we talked about all these young players and all these sneaky good teams that you know, everyone's talking about. And I was kind of the one that was like on the side of defending, like actually, yeah, like these young teams are kind of underrated and you know, this and that, but everyone's already jumped to the point of saying like, well, the, the Thunder are contenders right now and the Nuggets are not contenders right now. And I'm like, this yeah. is, this is madness. <laughs> like you can say these changes that OKC made, I see them if you know putting my analyst brain on, these might specifically address the things that I saw as their deficiencies keeping them away from true contention status. To you know, go as far as saying, you know, this team that has the same core as they did when they won the title two years ago. Yes, they lost um, you know, they lost their fifth man and they lost their sixth man the year before but they've still got, you know, guys coming through the pipeline and their best player, who is the best player in the league, <laughs> I might remind you, you know, is still around. I wouldn't even mind somebody like picking the Thunder over the Nuggets. Yeah. But the fact that you want to kick them out of the group of contenders is crazy. I agree. It's crazy. It's if point. what you're going to do is then like elevate OKC there. If you want to use this to go into some of the interesting rivalries and actually put these teams up, Head to head, we can jump in. Yeah, I actually thought about it. You know, yeah, that that's. I just wanted to say that I think the Nuggets are still contenders, but they have question marks about them, just like every other team at the top of the West, actually, because most of the teams at the top of the West have not won a title. The Nuggets happen to have done that uh, with the same core that they have right now, who are still in their primes. Jokic is not yet 30. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he's the oldest of the core. And so, you know, I just I just want to put that out there and let everyone know that there is not a fire. It's gonna be fine. They're gonna figure it out. They're not gonna be a play-in team. But we wanted to talk about Rivals Week because it's a series of these really fun national TV games that the NBA thought would be the best rivalries to, you know, bring in the casual fan these entertaining games between two teams that presumably hate each other and would play hard against each other, etc. Ideally, the two teams are good. But before we try to rewrite Rivals Week ourselves, Will, I wanted to get your thoughts on the matchups that the NBA chose mm -hmm. for these games. We got the Nuggets versus the Sixers on January 21st, and then on January 25th, Nuggets Wolves, who I would definitely say the Wolves are more of a rival than the Sixers. There's really only like an Embiid Jokic rival in regards to the fandom, but yeah. the teams aren't really rivals on the court. So I've always resisted the Sixers Nuggets rivalry. Right, we only get one Jokic and Embiid game per year. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of fans who want to see and Bede and Jokic go head to head. I think people are just interested in that. I'm don't really care about it. <laughs> like I don't even think Nuggets fans care about it. I think everyone else outside of Nuggets Nation cares about it more than Nuggets fans. Not that we don't care about it, but I think Oh no, Nuggets fans care. I think that Nuggets fans care than like either of the teams or like anybody. Or not Nuggets fans, but Nuggets fans and Philly fans, like you say. You think that Philly fans and Nuggets fans care more about their head to head matchup than most others? 
absolutely are you kidding me <laughs> i was partly drawn into this fandom based on the incredibly toxic nature of the mvp debate in 2023 yeah, so i true. know like, I, y'all I, can't hide well i think <laughs> okay. it's just maybe it's just me but i think there's been some i think people have been almost worn down by it to where people have stopped caring as much oh, yeah. in terms of comparing them and, and i'm I kind think... of over it because it's just like there's only one game a year mm-hmm. and i think it's more about the the fact that like the the debate about the quality of the two players themselves is kind of over like pretty resoundingly yeah, so yeah. i don't care anymore like i don't yeah, need exactly. a regular season win for my yoga resume I'm it's good. you know the sixers fans when people critique Embiid, will point to the idea that basketball is a team game and Embiid's never really had the right team around him in addition to his he injuries said great teams they win lots of regular season games so i don't know what they're talking about like they, he's i think he's about to have maybe the best team around him yeah, that I think he's so. had, but that doesn't mean the other teams weren't good or good enough. This season definitely um, will have uh, less excuses from that standpoint because they got Maxi, yeah. they got they got you rid of so. Tobias Harris, they added <laughs> Paul George. So that's like everything yeah. the Sixers fans almost wanted. Maybe there were some who wanted to get more role players instead of just splashing it all on Paul George. Whatever, we'll see how that works out. That said, I don't think it's that compelling of a rivalry from the Nuggets' perspective. I think the Wolves are easily the best rival for the Nuggets because they have the Tim Connolly aspect. You have the arguments that the Wolves were built specifically to beat the Nuggets. No matter where you stand on that, that is something. Uh, in the but ether. you wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> you can't just slip that in there. If you <laughs> don't think that they were, then you can't use that as a reason that that's their best rivalry. Well, I'm just saying the perception regardless of if it's true or not exists okay so well i that is true (laughs) because part of rivalry week is you know creating an air of like these teams hate each other right it's a bit of kayfabe right like nobody cares about the knicks and nets like the nets have been irrelevant for ever since i mean before kd left right like that's why he left and yet the knicks and nets get a game on rivals week yet again because it's the two New York teams that hate each other. It's a I'm actually surprised rivalry. they didn't do Lakers Clippers here, but the Lakers already have two other games on Rivals Week. I do think that most of these games are at least okay rivalries. I I think the 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 Warriors Kings game is kind of an underrated cinematic yeah. watch. I like that. But what I wanted to do right now, Will, was give both of us an opportunity to rewrite rivals week in the image of the most cinematic games so we were gonna list the five best rivalries in the nba to put on rivals week so you're gonna want to have good teams you're gonna have the games be competitive as much as possible you want to have the storylines around the two teams be incredibly juiced Mm -hmm. and then we're gonna let the people decide who is good at identifying the most cinematic rivalries in the nba Okay, so before I list my top five, I wanted to give an honorable mention to Pell's Grizzlies because the two Pell's Grizzlies games that I watched last season, which were the two that Jaw was present for, were absolutely like bonkers down to the wire. One of them went to OT. Jaw had the game winner in one of them. I remember that game came right before a really crazy overtime game with the Warriors and Celtics, but they only get an honorable mention because Zion is almost never healthy for these games and Jaw is off doing God knows what. Maybe we'll get four solid Pell's Grizzlies matchups this season that will be really entertaining, but I cannot put them on the list for that reason. Mm-hmm. All right. My number five is going to be Thunder Mavs. Both of these teams are good. Both of these teams, they played a playoff series against each other last year. Luka and SGA were number two and three in MVP voting. So you've got the individual player juice. The Mavs fan base is a very voracious, so they definitely had to be on this list because you know that they're going to be driving all the agendas and all the storylines online. And I think that that could make for some really fun games. Also, these two teams and just tend to play like crazy games against each other. Sometimes it's a blowout, but sometimes it's a game where 
OKC is up huge. The Mavs go on a 30 to two run, take a lead, and then OKC pulls it off in the clutch somehow. That's just like a thing that happens when these two teams play each other. Mm -hmm. So Thunder Mavs. I'm going to do something with Golden State because while I think that their better days are behind them, I think having Steph in there is fun. But I'm not going to go with Golden State versus Lakers. I'm going to go with Golden State versus Memphis. And Interesting. You know, they, they had the playoff series. Yeah, I really liked the Golden State Memphis beef. And now you're going to have John Morant back. And that rivalry's obviously fizzled out a little bit, but I still like yeah. the beef. And we need more I point guard versus point guard rivalries. I just think that, you know, you, when you have two guys where the ball is in their hands all the time, like literally all the time, and they're always initiating the offense, um, not, yeah. not necessarily in the case of Steph, but, you know, sometimes, and he is the point guard of that team. And I think it just makes for more of those, like, oh, those moments were like, oh, my God, Steph just crossed up jaw and then he buried that jumper yeah. in his eye, you know? <laughs> and there's some interesting, like, Jaron Jackson, Defensive Player of the Year, that maybe was not earned. And Draymond Green's, like, the gatekeeper of that award all the time. <laughs> uh, True. So, oh, my gosh, that's so right. I don't know that it'll really work, but I, I like the idea of that more than, like, Golden State versus the Lakers, personally. I wonder if Draymond's going to start antagonizing Wemby when he starts becoming the favorite for defensive player of the year. <laughs> Maybe he will just, he'll be like, yeah, he deserved it. So we'll see. My number four, I'm going to go with one that is a newly budding rivalry, but which produced probably, I think most people would agree, the best games of the playoffs. Give me Nick Sixers. Ooh. All of these games were one in the clutch, every single one of them. It was ridiculous. <laughs> 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 the Knicks fan base started to turn on Joel Embiid during a, I think it was game three in Philly when he started being ridiculous and like hurting guys, committing flagrant fouls. That was so weird because that first half of that game, I remember talking about it like he was acting like he wanted to get thrown out of that game. And then he decided to like bury four jumpers in a row in the third quarter and then the Knicks were able to somehow claw back, but Philly was able to hold on at the end. But those games were cinematic. You have two good coaches in Tibbs and Nurse, and we talked about how, like, oh, is Tibbs actually underrated? Like, he kind of outcoached Nick Nurse when you think about the caliber of players that the that the Knicks had relative to the Sixers. You've got Jalen Brunson, who was another MVP candidate. He was fifth on uh, – he got – he was fifth in votes there. Fun point guards in him and Maxi, of course – now the Knicks also have Mikhail Bridges, and obviously they had OG as well. I think both of these are good teams in the East, and everybody loves when the Knicks are good. Everybody loves when the Knicks are involved in a rivalry, so much so that they would put the Nets on national television. So yeah. I'm going to go with Knicks Sixers here. Yeah, for my number four, I'm considering that one, but also Knicks Celtics. Mm -hmm. Like, are the Knicks going to be good enough to be there, rivals yeah. with Boston? I don't know that it's there. So... By that, I'm just going to, this isn't that good, but it's only number four. But I'm going to go with Milwaukee versus Boston. Interesting. Two recent teams from the East that won titles. I think still Giannis is good enough and Dame can be good enough if they can just get Middleton healthy and get back to playing well. That might be the most interesting threat. So I could be wrong in terms of what team can threaten the Celtics in the East. But just because you already covered Dick's Philly, I'll go Milwaukee, Boston. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. My next one actually also involves the Bucks. I'm going to go with Bucks Pacers here because every single Bucks Pacers game in the regular season when everybody was healthy came down to the wire. They were incredibly competitive. We saw Tyrese Halliburton have his coming out party. He did the whole Dame Time thing. The kid understands kayfabe. He understands entertainment. He knows what the people want, and they want, you know, rivalries. So uh, because of Halliburton and how defensively challenged both of those teams were, they, they were these, like, high-scoring affairs <laughs> also. This is a thing with the Pacers, but it turned out the Bucks were also defensively challenged. I wasn't sure if like there was something with that matchup, but it turned out the Bucks had other issues all season. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Bucks Pacers. Okay, I think for my 
Number three, I'll steal one of yours and go OKC versus Dallas. Just the SGA Luka thing, they already played in the playoffs. I think if OKC is theoretically better, maybe OKC wins a series versus Dallas this year. As a Nuggets fan, don't want to play the same teams over and over in the playoffs, but I, as a fan, I would like to see OKC and Dallas play again another playoff series. That would be fun just to see how that shakes out. My next one is an old favorite. I'm going to go with Nuggets Lakers. These two teams have history that predates both of their cores with the, you know, multiple times that the Nuggets and Lakers had met each other in the playoffs years before. We had Kobe versus Melo, et cetera. The current cores are obviously a bit of a mismatch with LeBron entering what would be really like the end stage of a career for most basketball players, if not already done. But let's say like past his prime, not entering, like he, he is past his prime, but he's still obviously a very good NBA player. He's an all NBA caliber player. Because of the two very competitive playoff series between these teams, very competitive sweeps, gentlemen sweeps, there are narratives galore. Every time that the Lakers come close to winning, or win in the case of the one that they got in this last uh, year's playoffs, there's all these stories about like, what more can the Lakers do to like put more around LeBron so that he can win? And then I'm just like, Hey, what about Anthony Davis? Because even LeBron said that Anthony Davis has to be their best player if they are going to win a title, another title. And yet he keeps getting soundly outplayed by Nikola Jokic, even in series where he's not at his best as the last one, I would argue. So I'm going to go with Lakers Nuggets. It's also really good because the Nuggets never blow anybody out. So all those games are down to the wire. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a preemptive one. Oh, this is kind of stupid, but I'm going to pick two Denver ones and one, two. I'm going to do Denver versus Dallas. Wait, you have, oh, you're going to go one, two with Denver. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a chance that things get more heated with Dallas and Denver this season. Maybe they match up in the playoffs this year. I just think Jokic and Luka have too much respect for each other to That's actually true. trash talk. And Kyrie's not really like a trash talker, and neither is Jamal, is the thing. So yeah. like you need for there to be an existing narrative outside because the players aren't going to give it to you in that particular matchup. I think. That's what I'm saying. Like I'm preempting this because I don't think there's enough there mm. yet. But last year we had the like Kyrie shot we lost to. Right. I do think maybe the respect between Luka and Jokic won't make this a juicy rivalry because they are both so good. And like maybe one, two, theoretically, you could argue in the MVP race. Maybe it's a friendly rivalry. You know, rivalries don't have to be Ooh. bloody. <laughs> Ooh, that's not what the people come here for. We're talking about putting butts in seats and getting eyeballs on screens, Will. We need <sighs> outrage and anger. The thing is, I'm not picking the Lakers because I think most of the rivalries are said and done. Boston already won Not because they're not good. <laughs> yeah, Boston won the extra banner. The Nuggets keep destroying the Lakers. That's over with. The, the Lakers don't want anything to do with the Nuggets anymore. They're going to avoid them. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> uh, and the Steph thing, like both of those teams are kind of not that good. So maybe it's a fun rivalry, LeBron versus Steph, but also like. Yeah, just, that's a good point. I just don't we want care the teams to be more anymore. evenly matched. They don't necessarily both have to be like great, but they have to be like good. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see how Denver takes some of these matchups with the top teams in the West. I think that you can always tell when the guys are particularly locked in because they want to send a message. And I just keep going back to both of the games against Boston last year. They were just playing with a different intensity in addition to, you know, any like coaching side adjustments that they made. I remember like we always complain about Jokic having say inconsistent aggression First five plays of that game, it's just Jokic posting up Chris Stops to show like this guy can't guard me and force Boston to change their yeah. um their strategy. And yeah, you know, maybe. Jamal like went off in that game, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that I'll be interested to see how they take the top teams in the West also. It's mm -hmm. gonna be a different atmosphere than it was at the beginning of last season, say when they played they actually played OKC early and kind of thrashed them in that game. Mm -hmm. But they played Minnesota early and seemed to not take that game as seriously as they did, say, in game 80 when they beat Minnesota toward the end of the series or end of the season. 
right? Once they knew like, oh, this is like a good team. We're at home. We want to send a message. I'm curious to see how they take these games against OKC, Dallas, and Minnesota. Memphis as well, because they're going to have not just everybody back, but a, a different core because they've had some guys leave since Memphis was kind of at its um, at its peak of, you know, 52. How, how many games they won when they were the two seed a couple of years ago? They're slightly different now. So they're going to be wanting to send a message as well with like a, with a, you know, jaw basically having a year off <laughs> yeah. with his suspension and then the injuries. So that's, that's what makes rivalries good, right? Whenever, when both sides want to send a message, I don't know, I'll go because I think I think I've got the best one here, and it's like a it's like a sneaky good rivalry, hiding in plain sight. Because the NBA actually did give some airtime to Warriors King, and oh, maybe whoa. I am biased <laughs> because I live in the Bay Area. But let me tell you, those two teams do not like each other. Mike Brown, like I've talked about in the past knows that knows that warriors team inside and out and takes advantage of their weaknesses with with like a, a brutal aggression he is relentless in how he attacks golden state's weaknesses and golden state takes advantage of sacramento's weaknesses particularly defensively which is why these games are always so high scoring they are always so fast and so fun they come down to the wire it's clutch king fox who actually won the clutch award versus steph curry who did he win the clutch player of the year last year or did it go to Demar? I think Steph won. So we've got two clutch Kings sitting in the Bay area that play each other four times every year. There could One be of some those buzzer times beaters. Absolutely... Yes, exactly. One of those times should absolutely be on NBA rivals week. And this is the one that I think the NBA absolutely got right. No notes from me. I should have had golden <laughs> state Sacramento too. Now that I think about it, but that's what I thought you were going to do. But well, to be honest, I just didn't really know how those teams felt about each other. Like I knew they just had the, you know, play in game where the Warriors got eliminated, but I didn't know if they like really cared about Sacramento or not. But you You're just enlightened me on that. So there you go. That's a great one. But because I've already chosen, I'm now forced to go Denver, Minnesota as number one. What? Okay. Yeah. Wait, because... when you say you already chose. Like I already chose number two, Denver, Dallas, so I can't. I'm not going to mm. change that. But I think going from descending order because I didn't write this out ahead of time, it's yeah. almost like that those games that people play where they like rank these, you know, and you know where they like right, throw without out random knowing, stuff. like yeah, without what's knowing next. Yeah. So now I got stuck with Denver v Dallas number two, which probably isn't the best it was rivalry. Your own brain will. But I'm definitely going Denver versus Minnesota. I don't care if the national audience doesn't care about this as much as I do. They had two playoff series back-to-back -back years. I said at the time, whoever won that series last playoffs was going to win the championship. Obviously, that didn't happen because Boston was ahead <laughs> of both those teams. And yeah, there's just so much there with the Tim Connolly and the elimination games. Now we have this seven-game series where we blew the lead. Anthony Edwards at the time was being discussed as like the next Michael Jordan and the next best player in the league at that time yeah, when they were right. up. They got talked about as the best defense in the last 30 years, whatever the hell that was. So I think it's kind of a battle of the Titans a little bit with Jokic versus Ant versus Gobert versus Cat. The fact that Minnesota didn't win the title probably lowers the heat of this rivalry down from a national perspective because people are going to care more about like the big stars still. Not that these teams don't have big stars, but just they're not the typical stars. Yeah, no, I think I think I generally agree with that. I, I I'm going to be honest. The Minnesota Timberwolves probably don't want to play the Nuggets again. I don't think either <laughs> team wants to play got, each other. That pretty tight. Yeah. But I think <laughs> they're both still so good. good that it's still there and it's in play, whereas some other ones are not as like pressing. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. This is a very uh, present tense let's say, rivalry. And I yeah. do think that it's significant that the NBA gave these two teams a game on Rivals Week. They've got the January 25th slot and that they all four of their matchups are going to be on national TV this season, like I said. Adam Silver agrees with you, Will. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, out of our list, we only have, I think, two 
see uh matchups that are actually on the existing rivalry week slate which is that's right your warriors versus kings and my denver versus minnesota well that's it for that segment and our show is there anything else you want to throw in there no that was all i've had a really good time uh going over the nba schedule and i want the people to comment first i want everyone to say rivalry week <laughs> three times fast <laughs> and then i want you to comment below who you think has a better nba rivals week slate yeah and world. any ones that we miss that you want to watch oh um, yeah that too we want to hear from the people <laughs> yes but in the meantime like subscribe and share hit the notification bell leave us a review on whatever platform you are listening on or watching and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. We'll still try to be putting shorts up when we can. And check out our new Clips channel on What's in a Game NBA Clips. And remember, winning is fun and losing sucks.